in the food industry uh, sector in India. Uh, uh, there, there are certain uh, you know uh, schemes and uh, certain uh, other uh, initiatives like Pradhan Mantri Kisan Sampada and uh, P, uh, PMFME schemes that uh, the ministry has uh, from time to time uh, introduced to, to you know uh, uh, support the growth in the food industry business. So. Uh, uh, I, I would like to start uh, with uh, uh, discussing what uh, we'll be having a discussion in this uh, uh, in this panel. Uh, we'll first uh, uh, we'll begin with uh, tracing the remarkable journey of uh, food safety uh, and standards act in, uh, of 2006 in India. Uh, the regulatory mechanism of on uh, newer food categories and uh, its product system uh, promoting uh, Indian food uh, uh, globally uh, and uh, the emerging challenges in food safety in India. Uh, the other aspect would be uh, sustainable practices in food processing and its packaging. So uh, this, uh, these are the overview of uh, the topics that, in, that are being uh, you know, covered in previous session. Um, uh, I would like to introduce uh, our esteemed moderator uh, today's, uh, uh, for today's event is uh, Mr. Harinder Singh O'Brien. Uh, he is the Director of uh, National Institute of Food Technology, Entrepreneurship and Management. Uh, he is renowned for his contribution to education and research and uh, um, sir has been an advisor with the FSAI and um, he has played a vital role in shaping industrial food uh, safety policies and establishing uh, microbiology uh, labs. And uh, so uh, you have already uh, published over 100 research papers and uh, you have three patents under your name. Uh, so uh, sir, uh, please Thank you. Uh, join us on uh, Uh, next, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Amit Sharma, uh, he is the Director uh, at Food Safety and uh, Standards uh, under Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. And uh, with a, uh, uh, his expertise includes stand, uh, standard setting, uh, food safety audits, and uh, he has uh, uh, active engagement in regulatory authorities uh, for trade and uh, trade facilitation. So uh, please, Mr. Amit sir. Uh, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Seema Puri. Uh, she is a distinguished academic and professional with the MSc and PhD in food and, and nutrition. And she brings over 35 years of experience in teaching. And uh, she has uh, 110 publications uh, peer reviewed in uh, journal and other books. And she has member at 500 citation. citation. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, um, I'll, uh, I'll introduce uh, Ms. Vandana Tripathi. Um, she is a seasoned expert uh, with agri in agriculture chemicals and is currently as a network coordinator and principal scientist at uh, ICRA India uh, Agriculture. And uh, uh, she, uh, I would like to just uh, say that uh, she has uh, a gold medal for outstanding research in agriculture chemicals. So, um, uh, thank you for joining us. And I would like to introduce Mr. Manoj Pari. Uh, he's a distinguished professional in food industry, specializing in uh, nutritional food products uh, and their development. Uh, he's uh, currently the head of uh, research uh, and development for uh, Hindustan Unilever. And uh, um, uh, sir, uh, he, uh, sir has a um, uh, diverse career uh, spanning over uh, a, a lot of organizations uh, such as Nestle, Amul and uh, Heinz Kraft. Uh, even uh, Del Monte, 
and uh, he holds an impressive educational background in VTech uh, in uh, dairy technology and uh, diploma in metabolic disease. So please, sir. Uh, We really have a wealth of uh, knowledge here with, and, and, uh, at our dice, uh, stage here. So uh, uh, I would like to uh, ask Mr. O'Brien to start uh, with Dr. Thank you. statement which he said he, we need to further work on decreasing the reducing post service losses. And this food is something that you can't live without. Food, air, water, a few things you can't live without. So if food saves life, processing saves food. And processing brings prosperity. That is the theme of the session of the entire region that we have in here. And Industry, the food processing industry has really grown leaps and bounds. And the major change that has happened, a radical change that has been brought in, is in the forms of uh, the self help groups coming up and taking up entrepreneurship. The FPOs not only getting into production but getting into post production. A lot of entrepreneurs, if you look at the Shark Tank statistics, in Shark Tank 1, funding, the uh, maximum, about 46% total funding went to uh, the food processing sector. And in two, it was about 72 percent. So you can see that kind of jump that this sector is seen for the past few years. And with that, parallelly, there has been a growth in FSCA. 2011, FSCA just had about six panels. They moved to about 11 panels through 2016, and now they are 22 panels. I mean, because there are new emerging risks, there are new emerging safety threats, and FSCA has been uh, very actively working towards ensuring that the food safety ecosystem in the country becomes robust, becomes vibrant, and aligns well with the consumer requirements, aligns well with the food business operators, and you know, uh, the, the process of setting standards is very, very transparent in FSSCI. <coughs> and uh, to be very honest to all of you, I was just talking to, uh, to Mr. Sodi, who is the former uh, CMT of Amul. And uh, he made a very candid statement. He said that all these fellows thinking that USMD is very robust and strong. But then when he went to US and he saw that, you know, uh, almond milk hardly has anything in that. Maybe something like five uh, kernels of almond put in about 50 ml of water and a milk made out of it and being served that with no, hardly any protein. And even the consumer there is not all that aware. So the food safety ecosystem has grown over uh, time. But then there is lot which we need to do. So let me start with uh, <coughs> my former colleague from FSSAI. Uh, but Ahmed, FSSA has come out with regulations on nutraceuticals, the recycled plastic, and we have a draft on FOPNL, and then we also have uh, the one on FRK, now it's coming out with the special limits of premix also. What has been the general impact of all these regulations, the recent regulations on the industry? Uh, what industry feels about it and how is the consumer getting affected? What is the, the kind of comments and the reaction that you get from the consumer or the new regulation that we have not mm. Good morning and thanks a <coughs> lot uh, for setting the context for this session, sir. And what I foresee, not only from the Food Safety Authority's perspective, 
but if you look at the entire food safety ecosystem in the country, <laughs> there has been a paradigm shift since 2006 from the when we were talking about the prevention in the food food adaptation kind of things, and it has moved from the prevention of food adaptation to it has shifted to the quality consciousness, and we started developing the quality standards, including the industry and the laboratories. And again, there was a shift from the quality to the safety aspects, and then we started doing more of the risk assessment kind of thing, and we started to understand the revolutions with the science-based, risk-based, and then notify the revolutions on the contamination. And now again, we have shifted along with the food safety aspect to the nutrition aspect, and that, that's the time when uh, <coughs> we started notifying the revolution on the food safety related aspects. Apart from that, the one major change we have seen over the years is that we have tried to know the consumer's preferences and the choices by the inclusiveness of the entire entire activity and the processes. And that's the time we also wish that consumers should be uh, should be able to take informed choice, informed uh, decision in purchasing any kind of community. And that's the time when we came up with the revolution on the labeling and the advertisement and the things. Uh, the e track initiative which was started uh, by Good Safety Authority is a sort of code of the government approach and we try that consumers should, also not, should not only consume the safe food but they should also try to consume the, uh, have the healthier options. The major change which I foresee, which I see now that we have come out with a revolution on the vegan food which is one of its unique in the world. Shall I use the mic or? Sir, so please it? use mic. Yeah. The major uh, change which I see that the, our, the revolution on the vegan food, which is one of the unique revolution globally, I think I should say, and the revolution on the Ayush Aha, which is one of its kind, so that we can not only promote the Ayurvedic food, but also have a distinction between the Ayurvedic medicine and the Ayurvedic food. And now the consumers are also getting more and more awareness in terms of the labeling requirement and what kind of food has to be consumed. And that's the reason that is like the way government is promoting the consumption of the millet-based recipes and the millet-based food items. Even the consumers are now demanding more millet-based options. So this is how we, I see that the journey of food is the first and the ecosystem. Well, thank you. I mean, uh, nudging the consumer uh, towards food safety, creating more awareness, and taking a leaf out of, in fact, I'm really privileged to have a esteemed panel with me here. So who are bringing a lot of diversity into discussions. And you know, taking a leaf of, of what uh, Amit said about uh, creating awareness from consumers about safety, quality, and nutrition. Now, you come from an academic organization, which does, you know, and you also just like you do that attitude. Now, what more do you think we should be doing to really create awareness among the lowest rung of people? I mean, how to get on with uh, the Khera Wala, the Lady Wala's? the Golgapa Wala's on the street, make them more aware and uh, ensure that whatever they are serving is healthy food, safe food. And what do you think FSC can do more? FSC can come out with long initiatives, like, uh, like Eat Right uh, India, Eat Right campuses, Eat Right stations, Eat Right schools. But then what more can be done by FSC, maybe by government and academy put together, to create awareness at that level? Actually, I am a teacher, so I can feel out So, uh, actually, I think with regulation, as Amitji said very rightly, education or creating awareness is very, very important. And awareness among all stakeholders, so whether it is the consumer who goes to a telewala to buy something, or the telewala himself, uh, his assistants, his uh, washerman, whatever. We need to really create awareness about food hygiene, food safety, as well as the nutritive content, whether it's healthy to eat, because uh, we are, you know, in the midst of what we call a triple burden of nutrition. So we have obesity, we have undernutrition, we have micronutrient deficiencies, and it's really necessary to get to them. Now, what is the means of getting to them? Uh, I know FSSAI has a very strong link with the Street Vendors Association. And with NASLI, you do a lot of programs of uh, creating awareness among them. That's one step. Uh, it's also important to use the media. And uh, not only the traditional media, 
which is, you know, newspaper or something is, which is for a literate audience. But today everybody is on WhatsApp. Everybody is on Facebook. You know, we have worked on these kind of studies and we have found that while Instagram and other such, they are a little elite because it's only in English. But Facebook is in Hindi also. And you know, that could be one, the social media could be a big uh, medium to generate awareness among all these people. You'll find today even a, a vegetable vendor or a Golga Pawala also has a, a Facebook uh, you know, connection. And I feel that is one channel which can be used. I also think the campaigns that they've done, like the Aaj Se Thoda Kam, that was very, very popular. You know, so having a tagline, having a, a, a kind of jingle, something which catches on and which gets transmitted very fast. You know, everything is viral on the internet today. So if we can generate that kind of a momentum, we will be very effective in bringing about. Yeah, good point. Uh, I would go back to uh, the comment on the same. Now, uh, she talked about, you know, uh, making the use of the entire media that is available with us. We have a very strong SPCT division also, which propagates information and everything, which you saw during the conference. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, but going down to the rural level and creating some kind of awareness among that population is quite sizable in the country. Uh, what more do you think FSS should be doing? Like we have the food safety on wheels, maybe have more of them on the, and then then go in vernacular, mm -hmm. so that you know you talk about to them. See the connectors made language, culture, food. It's something which connects everyone. Mm -hmm. And when you speak to them in their language, they understand it even better. So uh, are we planning to come out with the, you know the jingles or maybe the radio FM channels in uh, in different states and different languages? And uh, you know, creating more awareness through our FSWs and the other programs that uh, FSS, I mean, that FSS is having. So, what are those uh, newer thoughts about? It? Uh, sir, when we talk about the Indian food safety or the Indian food scenario, we talk about we are talking about the population of more than 1.4 billion, which means that we have a responsibility to ensure that every day more than 4.5 billion meals have to be provided which are safe and wholesome. But it's a big responsibility. And to comply to this responsibility, we have more than 7 million food business operators who are engaged in this activity. Now this number is really phenomenal. Because there are very, there may, I don't know whether China, about the China, but there may be very few countries who are having this kind of numbers with them. Uh, food safety authority alone cannot do this work. Uh, as we region cannot do this work on, on their own. And as, as I said, that, that this is the beauty of the department, that the inclusiveness is in, indebted in the, com completely into the working of the department. So with the whole of the government approach, the different ministries, involvement of the state governments, even the involvement of the uh, private players would really play a big role in ensuring that the my end consumer who is living down in the rural village who don't have much access to even to the Facebook or to the WhatsApp, they should be able to get a safer food and they should be in a, they should be made sufficiently aware that they may consume the food uh, they, they may be they may be empowered enough to have an informed choice whenever they go into the market to buy any particular food for apart from that <coughs> of course the social media is a very big channel but in certain areas that doordarshan plays a very big role so we have been working with the doordarshan also the all india radio has a big penetration in the rural part of it However, uh, we should not think that the rural in the rural area people consume un less healthy or unhealthy kind of food, and it's a it's a basically food habits in the urban area. So we have to be more proactive in the urban part of, or semi-urban part of the country, wherein we know that this food is unhealthy still we consume. Now, how to do it? So the the best option is that we should try to educate our children in the school. If if my school teacher is, uh, ask my kid that you should not consume the chocolates, then he will ask me also not to consume the chocolates. So that's one of the best options which I have witnessed practically at my home also. And next again is that uh, especially in the cities like Delhi or the metro metropolitan cities, if you can work with the uh, cooperative group housing societies. So there was a movement in the past by the food safety authority also wherein the uh, the domestic help who are involved in and uh, preparing the food at the home. So they were also guided that how they can cook the food with less fat and less salt into it. 
But only one approach cannot work, of course. There will be multiple options, as, as I have mentioned, as jingles kind of things, as regular advertisements in the newspapers, and continuous direct dialect. And we all are sitting over here. Uh, but still, if samosa comes in front of me, I will consume it <laughs> instead of consuming a millet cookie. So it has to come from inside, and then we have to keep on nudging the consumer that yes, this is healthy, this is healthy, this is healthy. So this is how we can. Can I add something to this? Uh, uh, Amitji's uh, statements just uh, you know, uh, triggered me to realize that you know agricultural <coughs> universities in India are in the rural areas and they have a very big extension division. And also the KVKs, the Krishi Vigyan Kedras, they are another channel because they also teach you know food preservation and some basic food processing techniques so they could also be used to spread the message. And the other thing when he said like he would prefer a samosa to a millet-based cookie. So I think we really need to make healthy food aspirational. You know, because every child maybe wants to have a burger or a pizza, but if you uh, tell him to have a ragi dosa, maybe he's not interested too. Can we make that aspirational? Can we make, give it a fancy name, you know, like instead of a ragi cookie, you say a chocolate chip cookie or something and the child would like to have it. So that's another very important thing, to make healthy food aspirational for the young people. Uh, but fooling kids these days is not all that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, are, uh, they are the millennials. Yes. <laughs> Gone with those days, like, you know, when it used to be just following what our parents used to say, that old they start. But now things have totally changed. No, but then uh, let me go to the, let me look at the industrial perspective. I would still want to eat samosa. There's no harm in eating samosa because that's fried. Uh, there's hardly any risk of food safety because the tires are totally boiled. But what is industry looking at it? Uh, what is the industrial perspective to creating, uh, of creating a samosa, maybe with little less fat, and also making it even tastier? Because the person, I mean, let's uh, not discount the fact that the rural population loves to have tastier foods. They don't eat for filling their tummies. If you ask a boy, no, what is your preference, he will say, even I would like to have a burger. No, I can't afford to have it, I would like to have a burger. So what is the industrial perspective to creating burgers and samosas of tomorrow? If you have less fat and a little more healthier. Rather than changing the names, but making a product as such, uh, which is more compatible with uh, all, all the strata of the population. Thank you, Dr. First of all, thank you so much uh, for uh, bringing me here and uh, uh, a good uh, discussion started with uh, Amit and uh, Dr. Sima Puri. Uh, it is all about aspiration and I think uh, how things are changing around us. In this world, uh, this particular world, we see that uh, the information is flowing to each and everybody of us so fast. And uh, I will just start with the example and it's a very interesting example and I have been almost 25 years in this industry for developing products. And uh, uh, particularly in India I have met many consumers throughout this journey. And I have seen uh, when you used to do the consumer researches uh, uh, and meeting consumer 20 years back, it used to be very difficult to find a teenager to explain uh, that what they need okay, and what is the aspirational product they look like. But now I will give you an example, recently I met a consumer and uh, that guy was a uh, LSM uh, 0 to 3 and the guy was basically an onion or potato seller. Okay. The way I started with him, uh, he of course started little bit, uh, uh, I would say innovation and then he started, then he, I realized that he had two lives. One life he lives is a potato vendor, second life he lives is a TikTok star. Okay. So uh, he has two phones. So two phones means uh, he completely changed the paradigm for me and he said that uh, this is my functional thing but this is my aspirational thing. So the information the person is getting and the videos the person is making, the, 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 the clothes, he, the attire he is wearing and uh, even I will tell you the things he is aspirational to buy is also completely changed. So we are in a situation that uh, as an innovation uh, people we finding it very difficult in this changing world that how we, we give that target product to the consumer because through Instagram, through Facebook, through so much social media intervention, they know that what is happening in 
what product is getting developed in US, what product is getting uh, developed in China, what are different type of formats and all, and and they know, and and FSI definitely has a played role into it that doing uh, putting lot of information. Now we all know coming back, uh, we know that each vendor now have a FSI license. People relate to it. People have a helpline where to complain. People understand hygiene. People also know that what type of product can come out from which type of organization. So these things are changing. These things are changing for a better world. Uh, as Dr. Ogre has asked, how we are, can make it more healthy and more, I would say, relatable to the uh, to the new consumer. Uh, definitely, there is a good scope. So we have to create product for every uh, every from masses to uh, to the premium segment. And what we can do, of course, how to make things like samosa healthier or maybe maybe Indian snacks more healthier. Uh, we have seen examples of that coming up, uh, where you can use better quality fat, frying time you reduce, you can reduce the uh, number of types of uh, the, uh, the oil which is getting fried, various type of intervention uh, in terms of processing, do mechanization of that. And more than that, I think uh, uh, what I've seen is it always helps. And it helped uh, in my own organization as canteen that when you put calorie in front of uh, that particular dish, it always helps to reduce the portion size. And that is where I think we have to work toward concentrating the product more. So maybe a samosa which is a lower in size but giving the taste. So so that that really helps. So make people, it's all about making people aware that it's, it's a samosa make, giving me 250 kilo calorie. Because the same person is also getting a feed that I have to manage my weight or from, from some social media things that I eat. So it's a very correlatable thing. So we should do this kind of thing more that okay, put uh, the type of calorie of the fat, type of fat we are using, type of I would say uh, the uh, uh, definitely there is a good amount of information available between a better kind of flour or better kind of cereal or milk. It. So it's, it's very interesting, but we can always do together. As part of the regulator is doing making awareness, we are making consumer aware and of course industry doing it. I mean we heard it from the horses mouth. Uh, very clearly, like, you know, there are uh, technological interventions and uh, definitely uh, the serve size plays a very, very important role. And that is, uh, and the, yesterday when I was talking about the badam milk, the almond milk, the serve size mentioned it was too small. So that is what uh, Mr. Sodhi said that uh, this, is, this kind of labeling, if had it been with FSSA, they would immediately sprung into action. So, uh, now, we talk about foods, we, uh, we're talking about KVKs, we're talking about ICR Institute, we talk about the farmers, farmer centric approach. There have been issues with the, the pesticides. There has been industrial use of pesticides that everybody talks about. There has been, there have been problems with our soils and the heavy metals. There have been problems with the, the mycotoxin accumulation. So, uh, I would now go to Dr. Vanna Tripathi, who has been part of our panels for quite some time and uh, she is an authority in being a project coordinator or uh, the all the network project of visually monitoring with ICAR. What is that FSS needs to do more to bring out the regulation on pesticides which are more effective and the limits which, are, which can be analyzed? Now going for the 0 0.01 ppp really doesn't make uh, uh, ppm doesn't make much sense to uh, many of the companies because they say that many of the pesticides in fact are not even present. They are not even sprayed on a particular crop. So what is the new panel doing and how are you going about it? Who are, you know, harmonizing with codex or coming out with their own regulation on or the threshold values, which will be helpful for the industry and without compromising on the safety of the patient. Oh, very good morning to all of you and uh, thank you very much uh, all the eminent speakers and it has been a very interesting discussion so far and uh, in fact uh, the uh, here we are talking about you know how to get better food how to improve the quality of the food uh, but let me take you slightly back to a place where we are uh, producing the food so the first requirement which comes into picture is whether we have that sufficient food or not. So this, as we are very well aware, there was a time when India was importing most of its food. So from that era to this era where we are an exporting country, we are exporting and 
world is looking at us to give us more food. So I think a big thanks to our farmers, a big thanks to all the people who have worked behind, uh, you know, this uh, particular, for this particular achievement. And definitely there is, because once, you know, there is a sufficiency in food, now there comes a question of whether that food is safe, what is the quality of the food. So now we are at a stage where we are thinking about all these things. And to be very frank, what comes on the central of this is the pesticide because pesticides have been, have played a very important role in enhancing the production of uh, the different uh, food grains, the vegetables, the other crops. But definitely the concerns have come along with these pesticides because their non-judicious use has also led to some of the serious consequences in terms of pesticide residues which are really creating a lot of problems from not only consumer safety perspective but also in the trade. So when any uh, consignment is exported from India and residues are above a particular level then that consignment has a chance of getting rejected by the exporting country and our farmers and our exporters this summer suffer huge losses because of that. So the thing is that whether these pesticides, because these are something which are legally permitted to be used in the country. So if we look at the present scenario, there are more than 300 pesticides, 330 pesticides which are registered for use in our country. So the farmers, they, are, they can use those pesticides on the crops. But then when it comes to what those they have to do, what are the good agriculture practices that the farmers have to understand, how much they have to spray, what dose they have to spray, what interval between the different applications they have to keep. So all that thing plus the most important thing that what should be the time interval which should be there between the last application and harvest. That is the safe interval. So whether the farmers they are observing that safe waiting period or not. So all these things come into picture and they lead to a situation where there are certain residues, pesticide residues in the food which are a matter of concern. So food safety standard authority of India, this is, we are in a good position because we are one of the few organized countries in the world which is having a very robust system of standard setting for pesticides in the whole world. So globally there are European food safety authority and uh, some other countries, uh, you were like US and Japan and some other countries. but. We are also one of those countries which have a very robust system. But the challenges are too many. Because if there are 330 pesticides which are registered in our country for use on crops and the number of crops, at least the major growing crops also, if we see there are more than 100. So if we see that all the 330 pesticides, they have to be, if they have to be, MRL is to be set for every pesticide on every crop, then the combinations go from 330 into 100. So that much number of combinations have to be evaluated. And if you just go through how much studies are involved in the registration or MRL setting of one pesticide on one crop, then that exercise takes around three to four years. Because the data has to be generated in different agroclimatic zones of India and that then the, that data has to be analyzed in the, the crops have to be analyzed in the laboratory and that data will further be uh, evaluated by the risk managers. So this is a very big exercise and it will definitely require a lot of uh, you know inputs, a lot of resource inputs and a lot of time inputs. So based on all this, when we arrive at some MRLs, then that is just one pesticide on one crop which is registered or MRL is set. So in this scenario, setting such MRLs for so many crops is really difficult. So internationally, if we see FAO, WHO, Codex, they have a very good system where there are experts from all over the world who are evaluating this, doing this risk evaluation and they are setting the MRLs. So FSSAI in this particular panel we have taken that decision that we, we will be harmonizing our MRLs with the international MRLs so that not only we have some, uh, you know, we can have MRLs for our own country also this will facilitate in the trade when we are exporting our commodities to different countries 
So rather than having some stringent MRLs in our country, we harmonize with the MRLs which have been set at the codex level, then it will be a good thing. So that is what I just want to put forward, that it's a huge challenge which uh, FSSI is dealing with and definitely uh, ministry, all other um, stakeholders like Ministry of Agriculture is involved in it and the other ministries, they are from time to time giving their inputs and uh, because it's a Herculean task to manage such a big uh, thing, so definitely we are working positively towards it and hopefully in the near future we will come out with some uh, good mechanism to go forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I know it's a humongous task, but then uh, somebody has got to work to build the cat as well. Now, like, if we have to think independently, as not as a member of a uh, scientific panel of, of FSSCI, what do you think could be the best approach? Which other departments, which governmental agencies have to come together and formulate a project maybe for going for crop grouping so that it don't have to go into for 300 to 100? Uh, or you know some kind of mechanism that could be worked out so that you have standards for a particular crop group and that too which are based on the data which is collected from all the nooks and corners of the country, dividing country into different agroecological zones and seeing the effect. So what as an individual do you think, as a scientist, as an agriculture scientist could be done? What kind of networking, what kind of support is needed from FSSAI? What kind of support is needed from the Ministry of Health? What kind of support is needed from the Ministry of Agriculture? Because we have to do it one day. And why not put it there? So because we just can't keep waiting for you know, the doctors to get into a system, the residents to get into a system and cause all sorts of cancers. You know, there's a train which runs between Patinta and uh, uh, Bika every day called uh, Cancer Express. So that's all largely because of the pesticide residue. There may be other factors also, but this is one of the major factors. So what do you think as a, as a scientist we should be doing? What kind of project that we should be doing so that we ease out of few things? Definitely, I think your point is uh, very right. So, uh, already uh, this, uh, there have been a lot of uh, you know, brainstorming meetings regarding this and uh, we are coming up with an approach on the implementation of crop grouping where uh, in lines with the Codex Alimentarius Commission, we in India, whatever crops we are growing in India, because there are some major crops, there are some minor crops which do which are not produced and consumed to that extent which the major crops are done. So the crops have been grouped into different crop groups and based in that particular approach the data has only to be generated on the representative crop. And the data which is generated on the representative crop will be applicable to the entire group. So if a group MRL is established for that particular crop then for that pesticide, the uh, MRL will be applicable to all the other crops in that group. And that uh, has already been taken up on the war, war footage in the Ministry of Agriculture. And the same has also been taken up for discussions with FSSI. And definitely, uh, because the problem is of a huge magnitude, all the departments and uh, FSSAI, Ministry of Agriculture, we have to come together and also getting the inputs from the Ministry of Commerce where there have been instances of export rejection. So what are the pesticides of concern which are leading to the rejection of those export consignments. So all this data is to be collated and we have to come out with such recommendations you know, which are not only uh, from the consumer safety perspective, but also taking into view the farmers' challenges which are there for record, which the uh, insect pest and diseases which they are facing in the field. So they have to be considered, our con uh, consumer safety has to be addressed and also the trade challenges. So I think holistic approach from all the ministries, we have to come together and definitely address this problem and uh, go forward. Uh, thank you. In government, actually, we do a lot of brainstorming. We keep storming our brains, and then uh, this process <laughs> goes on. It's all never ending process, but actually not implemented. Now, uh, you know, I would like to ask Dr. Amit uh, that you know, you've you worked with EIC also. I'm sure there must be some software with EIC where we get all sorts of data of the consignments that are getting rejected, and those which are getting rejected frequently. Now, can because FSCC doesn't have uh, the exports purview, I mean, it doesn't have a control over the exports. 
it has not uh, exposed under its purview. But still, if this uh, and what are you importing and what we have uh, in our domestic market, if this can be somehow channelized, the data that we get from the export uh, rejection or the, the data from the labs which have, which have analyzed the samples abroad and the influence that we have in our country, do you think there will be some kind of momentum going and can serve as a response, some kind of information to the panel? So the panel will think about it, what kind of crops need to be grown? Is it to be family based? Is it to be based on a particular season? Or where the grey areas are? Because still, you know, a lot of the consignments are getting rejected because of the necessary resources. I'm not going to talk about the MRL levels here. I'm not going to talk about uh, the dominance of the European uh, Union in this. But purely on scientific basis. So can we harmonize these softwares and get some information and we apply artificial intelligence, get some data out and then give it to the panel and say that, look, here is uh, the information that we got. These are the rejections of home export. These are the products which they, they sell through, but that, those, those are the bottling cases. And this is what we are seeing in the domestic market through the information portal. Uh, sir, there is a portal of the Department of Commerce which is called as the Export Rejection Alert Portal. And there are <coughs> few sources from where this portal gets the data. One is that the Export Inspection Council, the APIDA and APIDA, they have access to the rapid alert system of the food and feed, which is the rejection alert portal of the European Union. And then they also have access to the import rejection alerts issued by the US uh, FDA and the USDA. And then there are rejections which are issued directly by the countries like Kuwait, Malaysia, Indonesia, directly through their embassies. And then there are rejections which are which we which the, the Department of Commerce receives from the countries directly, uh, like uh, Singapore Food Agency and then FSDP, FSPPS of the Russia and SFDA of the Saudi Arabia. <coughs> All this data is fed into this export rejection alert portal by the different community boards and the export inspection council. And uh, then they are mandated to give in the, the action taken against particular consignment and, the part and, and to action taken to prevent the recurrence of the uh, non-compliance at the importing countries. So for the food safety authorities concerned, we are also in the process of uh, developing our import rejection alert portal. And there was a proposal from the Department of Commerce that both the uh, export rejection alert portal and the import rejection alert portal should be integrated to each other. The basic idea of, it, of the integration was that we, we, we would like to understand the trend in the rejection. So one is the rejection on the base of science. But we have witnessed in the past that when we rejected the dates from Egypt, they rejected our meat and animals. And it was uh, understood that when we sent a delegation to the Egypt and then they clear all the consignments. Uh, this is one aspect of having this kind of portal so that we understand the trend that if I am rejecting something from one specific country or a group of the countries, how they are behaving with my consignments. Because the kind of commodity which we import and which we export are different. Second, what you have mentioned that the data will be accessible to the panels and to the authorities so that we know that on what molecule, at what level, at what level they are rejecting it and that may give us some ideas about the, uh, that they are benchmarking at the Indian standards. And recently the Commerce Minister, Honorable Commerce and Industries Minister has given a directions that no one should export anything below the national standard. And this line will come up in the winter session of the parliament when our act will be laid in the session, which means that if any consignment is exported which is below national standard and it is rejected by the importing country, it cannot be re-imported into our country as well if it is rejected on the basis of the safety factors. Thank you. Well, uh, a good thing about our panelists here is we all speak from our heart. And having worked, uh, me and Ramesh, we both are involved largely in the act development also, you know, what we've done. And uh, step forward, you know, uh, let me talk to taking, you know, moving forward, uh, Manmoj, you are uh, one of the market leaders in Kisan, the Kisan branding, government and agriculture, you the field. Now, when you process a product, because there might have been pesticides in the initial uh, tomato, right? The farmer would not have taken care, because normally these days we have uh, sort of a you know, customized kind of harvest, you can try to harvest in the people, especially in the language. So when you taken the tomatoes of the feed, they might have been pesticides, but you've watched this tomato, you've cut this tomato in slices, they've gone through a process of screening and uh, sieving, and then you prepare 
tomato juice which concentrates and then you make a paste out of it and from the paste you make ketchup. So, uh, do, do you think that processing largely uh, has a very big role uh, to play in disintegrating or you know, disintegrating all sorts of residues that are present? Do, does uh, HUL or any other company have uh, some data on uh, what was the initial load on, uh, in tobacco <coughs> and what it was once it was transformed into ketchup? Yeah, so uh, I will just come uh, not only on tomato but uh, the kind of agricultural practices uh, which, uh, we see and how industry can play a big role there. Uh, and uh, you can also visit uh, uh, your stall here that uh, what type of regenerative and sustainable agriculture practices we promote as part of organization because we have a climate action, uh, as I would say, uh, oath and we have to work around that and everybody is aware about the SDG goals and other things also. Uh, but we, uh, it, uh, see, first of all, as uh, Madam has mentioned, uh, that uh, it is all about uh, uh, to farmers level uh, because uh, they also get lot of information from lot of sources nowadays. And of course, we have KVK and we have our all agricultural universities disseminating the right information. Uh, but many times they also get information. So when they grow these products, probably uh, what the bigger organization can do, and, uh, and of course we do as part of our this one is, and uh, we work uh, with the company called Sehayatri Farms, and uh, uh, they, are, they are one of the biggest tomato growers uh, through farmers. And uh, we work with the farmers on right agronomy practices, and uh, of course, uh, from water conservation to I think the right kind of uh, pesticide use, right kind of seeds, right kind of uh, even uh, management of waste uh, coming out there. And we of course also uh, similarly we do this to tea as well because uh, we do. But uh, once we at a farm level, uh, if we are able to reduce uh, the uh, make a better intervention and reduce these kind of contaminants. Uh, that will definitely help, but yes, of course, processing do help because uh, processing also plays a big role in terms of uh, some of the parts which are uh, we you remove from the uh, crop, uh, particularly the fruit and other things which are directly exposed to these things. I uh, will definitely help to reduce the load load because if you reduce the skin part of it, uh, I think uh, 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 Madam is expert here, but I think largely the the contaminants are getting reduced there. And uh, once you do the processing, of course, uh, uh, microbial contamination is definitely taken care of there uh, because uh, you have a right process and right technology to get to your room and also similarly the preservation also paper. But uh, the intervention at the farm level and uh, whether you do uh, uh, good uh, producing practices in milk production to, to, to any types of uh, fruit production to vegetable production, definitely help to reduce and uh, give a better uh, product which is coming to processing and of course processing do have a big role because as uh, you mentioned starting uh, and, and it is processing uh, plays a big role is that uh, Prime Minister have also uh, mentioned the same thing that how we have to process more perishable items and uh, and we know the tomato and steps are perishable processing do play but we have to keep the shelf life and we can better use so processing do play a big role and uh, Similarly, the technology intervention, uh, uh, because some of the technology intervention which is right now available and they are also changing, uh, we, uh, of course we all know the agricultural starters are coming up, big technology, uh, I was really uh, getting into uh, now, uh, we, we are in a country where startups are working for a Fitbit for a cow and buffalo. So we have seen that kind of technology, that how much greenhouses uh, gas they produce and how much methane they produce. So next decade we will see this kind of intervention happening in farm level also which will definitely help us to produce right and of course I have seen this personally that farmers do, uh, uh, do uh, the practices which they feel are good and, and can really increase their produce and value. So they adopt it very very fast and now we have technology available in social media and all we can disseminate this information. But coming back to processing this definitely plays a big role and uh, more more better technology, more lesser intervention of uh, human and technology and uh, uh, producing a product target for the population. One slide more, I just some more to what uh, I think Dr. Manoj has very rightly pointed out some things and further to add on to it, uh, MRL of any pesticide on any product when it is fixed, it is on the raw agriculture component. 
and when raw agriculture is commodity subjected to any kind of processing, generally there is a trend that the residues decrease unless and until it is a case of the concentration of that particular commodity, for example, from green chili to dried red chili. In that case, because the residues which are there in the green chili, they will concentrate to the red, in the red chili because the water content the, has gone. So in that case, there are the processing factors which are worked out for the residue MRL establishment. In that case, that processing factor is the residues which are there in the processed food divided by the residues which are there in the raw agriculture <coughs> commodity. And if this factor is more than one, in that case, that processing factor is applied to that particular commodity. So in cases of chili, it has been seen that the trend is usually that the residues are concentrated from 7 to 10 times. So the processing factor is which is used is from 7 to 10 processing factor. So if the MRL in green chili is 1 ppm, then in red chili it will be 10 ppm. But in case of many other commodities like juice and other, uh, you know, cases, it has been seen that there is a reduction in the residues. So in that case, there is because the residues generally at harvest in the processed commodity will not be detected. So in that case, since it is less than the raw commodity, so we have already considered the worst case scenario while uh, establishing the MRL. So the MRL of the worst case scenario, that is the raw agriculture commodity is applied. This is just from the technique. Well, what I would suggest is let us carry out some kind of trials ourselves you know, by challenging a crop and then looking at the processing factor and then, evaluate, then arrive at an actual processing factor per crop. May not be per crop, but for the major, you know, the major products that are being sold in the market from say uh, fruits and vegetables. Now, uh, Dr. Manoj, I would just like to ask you, although we've been saying that we all speak from a heart and as you know, being part of FSC earlier, we all say that it's a very transparent process to be formulated the standards. But what is this industry's uh, view, perspective on the way the standards are being formed? Do you think FSSA needs to do a little more in framing even better standards for both quality, authenticity as well as safety? Or, or the industry is happy with the way the things are being done? So definitely the industry is happy uh, the way things are moving. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's more something, uh, uh, I think, uh, and, and why I say this is because uh, I, when I started my career, there used to be a yellow book called Prevention of Food Adulteration, you all know. So that used to be the Bible book. And we used to just mark something on there and say that is standard, that standard, and all these things. And we used to decide for that. And it's all about fat, protein, carbohydrate, and all other things you forget because somebody else is going to decide. So, but now we have come to a level uh, where we can say that uh, the industry standards have been formed. Uh, uh, a lot of new, uh, as uh, 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 I was telling, uh, the vegan standard, the standard of claim, standard of organic food. So, so how much we have moved uh, uh, forward in this kind of situation and I am sure uh, definitely industry has played a big role because uh, their inputs have been taken, they have been part of many panels, uh, they have given the draft regulation came, the input came, uh, it, it cannot be done uh, uh, by a single uh, way. But the transformation has definitely happened and uh, after the digitalization and the first talk and all these things are coming up. I myself is a Central Advisory Committee member from industry in FSSI, uh, so I know that how much discussion happens there, how much the ease of business practices are, are, are getting into, uh, into, into the uh, things in the educative body. So it is really helpful and uh, also digitalization of information is always helpful because for a small uh, person seeking a license, just going to the portal, getting the license, it becomes very easy for them. Otherwise. Uh, any license, uh, uh, it is it's very difficult for a person to find and how to find and also. So once they go into the system, they easily find the way. Uh, so digitalization is definitely helping. And uh, of course, I'm sure that uh, with the right kind of resources now coming in uh, FSSI and a lot of recruitment time coming in FSSI and, and right intervention, it will be even more better uh, for industry to participate. And these kind of forums also do help us uh, to participate more. 
and uh, really be part of the entire exercise rather than keeping it, uh, seeing it tomorrow. Yeah, I am so glad, you know, I did a part of the business here earlier and last week I have to be the business here. <laughs> so that's a major key to this session like this. And uh, adding on more to that, but I just have a small suggestion, having seen, uh, having worked with uh, the food regulator and <coughs> seen it so very closely. Uh, I mean, this for you, I mean, this is a suggestion on my side, is that whenever we come out with any new principle regulation, I would suggest, I have done it when I was part of the SSC also, is maybe we can have a small, before it goes to a scientific committee, I mean, if you feel it appropriate, let there be a small stakeholder consultation with at least the industry which is going to get affected. Not affected in that term, but I mean, who, who uh, will be, you know, uh, be involved in uh, processing the product or uh, if it is for uh, contaminants. So it, then it goes to committee and then you go for the draft regulation. I know that might deliver possible for 15, 20 days, but then it could be better that if you have this, that will really strengthen our uh, the standard setting process. Which is otherwise quite scientific. Uh, I cannot agree more uh, on this with you, sir, because Food Safety Authority has now working towards carrying out the regulatory impact assessment. Whenever we come out with any new regulation, we have to carry out the regulatory impact assessment, and the Government of India has mandated that by 2026, for all the ministries and all the departments, if any new regulation has to come up, it has to be back with the uh, RIA studies with them. Uh, as on date, they have uh, identified some 11 uh, services in which food safety is not in included. They, these 11 services are primarily pertaining to the services provided by the state government, like obtaining some NOCs or pollution control boards, the consent kind of things are there. But by 2026, everything will be in, under the ambit of the RIG. But sir, this we can definitely do that whenever we are coming up with a completely new regulation or a principal regulation, then before going to the committee, we can have a stable consultation with the industry and the industry associations. The problem only comes up with us that when we uh, finally notify it and then the industry comes up to us, comes to us saying that now there are some issues with this. And in fact yesterday when <coughs> there was a meet, uh, standard dialogue going on with the BIS and the DG BIS some, uh, in the can some water was being served uh, by the name of water. WPR. And then he raised the issue that uh, it is being sold as a non-carbonated uh, non water based beverage but under bracket non-alcoholic, same as this. And what they have done is that they have added 0.01% basil flavor into it. And by adding this, they have escaped from the BIA certification. <laughs> so my submission to the industry would be again that please try to ensure that you are complying to the regulatory requirements rather than trying to find an escape route that how you can escape from the BIA certification. Now this is the best example of it. Again, it's, it says non-carbonated water based beverage as non-alcoholic and there is no BIA certification. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Same thing here. Uh, it's not basic, but it's peppermint. That's all the difference. <laughs> so, uh, so, so this is how the industry plays around. But then, you know, in case if you have a good stakeholder consultation, private setting standard, so they will be more aware of what is a regulation, that what, what, whether we have to use mineral water or what it will be. Anyway, now coming to the regulation, since you are Dr. Seema Puri, we've been involved with FSS for quite some time. You were part of the, the labeling panel. FOPNL has been uh, in the net for FSSA for quite some time now. I would not like to discuss more about it. HFSS, we could not still finalize that. But uh, tell me, like, you know, uh, talk, let's talk about the other, the, the recycled plastic regulation. Uh, can we not do more about it? I mean, uh, we, as a regulator, FSSA can think about having standards for uh, the plastic that is getting used for packaging of food material, we, can we define the, the particle size, can we define, because as, as such we do not have a definition of a food uh, grade plastic, we don't have a definition of the bad plastic also. So though we, uh, the EC was formed, and I don't know, there must be coming out some reason, because I, I, mean, uh, I feel pain when I see tea, coffee being served in those polythene pouches. Sambar and the, you know, the hot sambar being served in that, and there's a huge amount of hydrogen thing. Straight food, and even in fact, in many other places also. I, I was there, you know, in, even in a, in a, in a five-star hospital. I would not, because Max and all the other five-star hospitals there. I just went outside, and there was a shop which was serving tea. And this guy gave me tea in the, the Nescafe cup, which is a paper cup. 
when it is given to the laborers across, you put that in panni with the poly. So, I mean, can something be done if we come out of the regulation that these have to be totally abolished? And uh, we, we you know, officially discusses with the uh, Ministry of Environment and takes it forward. So, what is your take on that? What can be done uh, to make this recyclable plastic or maybe come out with new regulation on the use of plastic in a very in a way that is actually beneficial for which can be enforced and beneficial to consumers? Yes, I think that's a very important issue, and uh, microplastics is going to become a bigger and bigger problem, and uh, they have innumerable health. Uh, Issues that's related to them, whether it's endocrine disruptor, whether it's uh, you know promoting weakening immunity, and we don't know what in the future. So uh, one is regulation, of course, very very important, and the second thing is to find an alternative. So there has been some research work I know being done on edible packaging and uh, safer kind of plastics being used. Uh, we do now have wooden straws, like we have straws which have now paper straws and uh, wooden cutlery and things. So some new initiatives are coming in. Uh, so one is regulation and the second thing is to uh, create consumer awareness. Uh, you know, it was interesting, I went down south uh, in earlier this year and in the Uti hills, plastics are banned. So they have a system where they have even mineral water which is being sold or packed drinking water which is being sold in glass bottles, right through, and there's, everybody has accepted it. And when you return that glass water bottle to any shop, you can buy it from X place and return it at Y place, they refund you 30 rupees. You know, and that has become a system, it is acceptable. And in fact, because we were, you know, carrying some plastic bottle from our travel, people, they were quite astonished when we even threw it in the dustbin. <laughs> Because it's totally banned. So I think, you know, creating that consumer awareness and also implementation of a regulation if it's enforced. We also have banned plastics in Delhi. But, uh, you know, even the vegetable vendors say, just in raid hota hai, us in le jate, then hum do din ke baad aate. So enforcement becomes very important with the regulation. And also, you know, like microplastics are even tea bags. You're saying paper cups, but even tea bags. Even when you tear open a packet, they go in the air. So we really need to look at food packaging. I'm not a food packaging expert, but I think alternatives to these are very, very important. Yeah, uh, truly, I mean, I, I totally, uh, you know, there were good old days when we used to drink Coca-Cola in the glass bottle. Yes. <laughs> I think those days will come back. Like the Dadima's therapy are coming back as we just before the Ayurveda and all those things also come back. But one good thing I saw about this pack was they said that it's made from the uh, from the biodegradable it's biodegradable in nature and it's made from composting itself. So that's something so industry is now getting uh, much more acquainted what they also need to do. And I think we've had a very good discussion. We talked about so many aspects, what spoke from our heart. We touched upon uh, what FSC could do better, what industry could do. And I think uh, if industry and FSCI and academia like us work together. We can work as change agents for the country. I would always been seeing that you know if we can you know uh, establish a food safety and regulatory research center at Niftam Kundli with support from uh, industry like HUL and Nestle and FSSAI, which will help us in better you know framing better standards, which will help us in having better regulatory uh, frameworks. <laughs> uh, the discussion that we had, it was we were being all very very transparent, all very threadbare. And uh, we, we just uh, no, uh, voiced our concern and our suggestions. If there are any questions, uh, we can just take them, maybe two or three and not more, because we are running short of time. Yeah, please. Yeah, we'll start with them. Thank you for this interesting discussion. I'm Shilmay Gavagopal from Kuchi Nari. And we have the depository of regulation <coughs> for 100 plus countries to monitor contaminants and residues from DC global, as well as the rejection from 180 countries. Uh, so my question to Vandana Ma'am and Amit sir is uh, regarding the pesticide part. One part is that we have rejection because of heavy pesticide. But the second part is related to the standards. For example, the rice from India is getting rejected because of pesticide, pesticide 
not because the pesticide is highly detected, but because the standard set by India is much lower than the standard set by European Union as well as USA. Their standard is 0.2, our standard is 0.01. So it gets rejected because they say when your product is not meeting your home regulation, how do you, although it is meeting my regulation, I am not accepting it. So when such regulation, the standards are being set, which are much lower than the, uh, the you know, other regulations, how do we comply at home country, I mean at, at home, and then are there any efforts taken to see that these things are at parallel because the trade is very much. Yes, uh, definitely I think uh, this is the exact <coughs> point uh, which uh, I was also trying to make. So the thing is that uh, these are the issues, these are some of the challenges because when MRLs are set in our country, they are usually set at, as per the good agriculture practices <coughs> and sometimes when we see in these trials there are no residues which are detected at harvest and then the MRLs are set at the limit of quantity which is quite stringent and when the MRLs are seen compared to other countries, these MRLs seem very stringent. So in this case now, this along with the, from the, you know, go ahead from FSSAI, we have gone on in the direction where we are harmonizing these MRLs with the codex MRLs and especially some other countries, developed countries, even European Union because they also have a, a robust food safety system. So we are harmonizing and doing the risk assessment of their MRLs from our country for our consumers. And if that risk assessment step is passing for our consumers, then we are adopting those MRLs. So we are very soon in the process of harmonizing these MRLs, our stringent MRLs, <coughs> for which are there at the higher level which are fixed in FOWHO codex or in the European Union. So already this uh, process is going on. I, I think uh, they have been transmodified also if not mistaken. They are just so, yet to be. So they might be in the next authority building, you might table them and yes. yeah. you have. I just wanted to add to it. Uh, it seems to be a very typical case to me wherein any importing country is rejecting any consignment saying that you are not meeting the domestic regulations. Now it's a fit case for India to raise a specific trade concern at the WTO because when any consignment is imported in India, we do not test it as per the exporting country yes. standard. Absolutely. We test it at the importing country yes. standard. So the rice consignments which were rejected, they were not even complying to Indian standard, but they were not complying to the EU standard as well. So rejections do not take place because they are not complying to the exporting country standard. Now, we are coming up with a notification that no one can export anything below the national standard, of course, then they should meet the, once they meet my standard, even if they are stringent than the quota or stringent than the EU standards, but they will definitely be compliant with the importing country standards. Another issue is that <coughs> yesterday when we had a CEO round table along with the uh, food processing minister and the commerce uh, and industrial ministry, and they raised a very peculiar point saying that we should not always look at the European Food Safety Agency or the US or the Russian standard setting bodies that if they have carried out the risk assessment, we will automatically adopt it. And what Sarah has mentioned that we should have our own risk assessment bodies which should be independent to the food safety authority. Uh, generally, risk assessment should not be a part of the food authorities. So if we can have some, some sort of independent food safety, independent risk assessment body and then let the region, regional food authorities look at it. That if this risk assessment body has carried out the assessment, then automatically they can adopt the those MRLs or the limits to it. That should be our approach, not we should be looking at the all the at the rest. Yeah. I think the amendment, the act will uh, bring in that. Yeah, you had a question. We're gonna have to split two questions. Because you already in lost continuation with the, in continuation with that, yeah. Just for the food processing industry, if we are doing the food processing for certain products, and as Nan says that there are certain parameters, MSL level, we can reduce it. As on that, food industry, food processing industry working on the issue of this to reduce the pesticide removed from the, if it is originated by the crop, by farmer. While doing the processing by the end of manufacturer's end, is it possible to reduce those levels by treatment of some other way, processing uh, some another technology? No, there are ways, there are ways to do that and a lot of research is being undertaken by research organizations for that. Like the use of liquidized water, <coughs> that has been done. But uh, then when you talk about, uh, as uh, she flagged the issue of processing factors, in fact this panel is also looking into the processing factors. 
which will uh, give better clarity and understanding, etc. Okay. Yeah, quickly. Thank you. So I'm Anu. I handle the annual technical press for Hashim India. So just when you are talking about challenges that industry is facing, so one of the challenges is that I think while the industry is trying to reduce the security burden to the consumers, we launch a lot of product with reduced sugar and all those content, but the feedback that we get from the consumer is sometimes is, is very shocking. For example, we launch a product with 40% reduced sugar. But the feedback that we have got from the consumer is something which we are not uh, expected. So how can we work on that and why we are... Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll take this question. See, technology. Let's go for 3D and 4D printing. Let's work together and formulate a product which is as tasty and as healthy. I mean, healthier than uh, the, the, the product which you have, but is, is it's most tasty. So this is the technology that will make a difference. Yeah, one last question. Right, I think we've answered all of them. So thank you very much, and we have a wonderful presentation. And then, uh, thank you, thank you, thanks again for uh, very. I uh, know. So just just yeah. a quick takeaway for the for the whole session. Uh, just you know, one thing that you can. No, I said that. I mean, uh, the bottom line is we all need to work together. The academy, industry, and government has to come together and uh, see that how we can strengthen the food safety ecosystem. Because a lot of food processing is asking to us, small uh, sector players are coming up now. In fact, in PMFME, there is a provision of 2.5 lakh enterprises at the farm level. To educate them, to bring it to a certain level, we need to do, we need to work with them. Um, even I think sir, there is a lot, lot of data uh, with the private companies and with the government as well. And it just needs to come together to you know, uh, help the industry grow. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, again. I apologize for uh, to all the panelists that I cut short your introductions. Uh, so just just for a token of thanks, uh, Manchu, please. <laughs> so compensating. <laughs> uh, uh, I forgot my name. My name is Inoshi and he's in the So you have to compensate for it. Thank you, Dogen, actually. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everyone, for participating.